1998 was a hell of a year for games. And that's just the ones I can show you on my PC right now. I was 16 when all that was happening. In the UK we finish high school at 16 and go into what we call sixth form or college. It's basically pre-university education. We don't have to wear the uniforms anymore and we get to choose more specialised areas of study, but the government still pays for it. If you're wondering, I went on to study performing arts in hope that I'd make it as an actor someday. I use a lot of the skills I learnt there in my current job, and indeed this YouTube hobby, but that just turned out to be the wrong dream for me. So by the summer of that year, I'd finished high school and in a bid to get a 3DFX card for our first, somewhat janky PC, so I could finally play Resident Evil at home, I got my first part-time job stacking shelves at a supermarket called Morrison's. This, among other things, started a cycle of monthly game acquisitions that saw me bringing home many a big box PC title and attempting to squeeze more and more power out of that old tower that was basically held together with duct tape even when we bought it. I was also a regular reader of PC Gamer Magazine. This was in no small part because of the demo CDs that came taped to the front of them. These would furnish me with tasters of upcoming games and even a few mods such as They Hunger for Half-Life. This one's good. This is actually how I got to play Resident Evil 2 and Final Fantasy VIII for the first time on my PC, and I replayed those 10 minute demos a hell of a lot. And this is also where I first heard about... Grim Fandango. While I wasn't a stranger to point and click adventure games, my first being Simon the Sorcerer on the Amiga 500, I'd never dove into the heavyweights of the genre. I've still never really got into Monkey Island, or a lot of the classic LucasArts games, but I've polished off a broken sword or two in my time. Even so, I was absolutely mesmerised by the art style. It was something I genuinely hadn't seen before in a video game. I couldn't quote the review now of course, but I recall it got me very excited with its talk of comedy writing, which had been one of my favourite things in Simon the Sorcerer, an incredible and original story about crossing the underworld with a Grim Reaper protagonist, and all sorts of weird and wonderful characters. So without even knowing who Tim Schafer was, or why I should care about that, I really wanted to play this game. When I finally got it installed on my PC, I was absolutely hooked from start to finish, and while there were a couple of puzzles that had me resorting to checking a guide in a magazine to solve, because we didn't have anything resembling an internet connection back then, I found that by the third chapter, I was very much on the same wavelength as the people who designed the game. They'd done such a good job of teaching me what they expected me to do, that it really wasn't that hard to imagine how the strange and mundane items that our protagonist Manuel could hold in the gaping void that exists in his inside pocket, were expected to be used to overcome seemingly insurmountable barriers. I loved everything, the art direction, the pre-rendered backgrounds, the peerless voice acting, the bizarre film noir gangster plot that took our heroes racing across the entire world and all the way back to the start, and the genuine character interactions that made me feel really connected with these walking skeletons and made me really care about their plight. After finishing the game for the first time, I probably replayed it at least once every few months thereafter. Backlogs were another thing that didn't exist back then. You'd probably buy one game a month, maybe two if it was a good month, and install and play them as soon as you got home. Anything that didn't work or you didn't like got taken back and refunded, while the other games got finished. So you'd usually have time to replay quite a lot of your collection in a year. It didn't matter that I knew all the solutions to the puzzles and that I was basically just going through the motions at that point. I was there for the story, the characters, and the incredible journey. It's been a long time since my last replay of Grim Fandango, over 10 years easily, long enough for me to forget most of the puzzle solutions, and even a good chunk of the story locations. I hadn't planned on replaying the game recently either. I just wanted to capture a little footage to use in a different video, but before I knew it, it was 1am, and I was trying to get a membership card into the Maritime Union again, and at that point I realised that, not only were the hooks dug in so deep I had to finish the game again, but I also really wanted to talk about it with all of you. Because even after 
26 years, Grim Fandango is still absolutely amazing. Hi, uh, Future Arkham here just chiming in with a quickie because I always forget to put this in my scripts, but don't forget to like and comment the video if you enjoy it, and please subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Also, I share video links on Twitter, but don't really use it for anything else, and I have a coffee account here if you'd like to tip me for my work. Also, keep an eye out for YouTube memberships and a Patreon coming. Okay, let's get back to it. It is a time known in the history books as 1990. Eight years after the E.T. apocalypse almost destroyed video games before they even started, creating a vacuum that was filled by a Japanese company that, once upon a time, manufactured playing cards, their family computer, rebranded as the Nintendo Entertainment System, has taken the world by storm, and its adorable Jumping Man mascot has become a household name. They are now one year out from showing the world what 16-bit gaming at home looks like, and the first true console war is just on the horizon. Three sweaty dorks with uncut hair and an unhealthy addiction to Diet Coke have yet to revolutionise PC gaming with its first true side-scrolling game in the form of Commander Keen, but are mustering in the back rooms of Softdisk preparing for this moment. And while the first Metal Gear and Snatcher have started transforming Hideo Kojima into the gaming auteur that we all know, Tim Schafer isn't exactly Tim Schafer yet. Believe it or not, even the head of Double Fine Games, the creator of Psychonauts and Broken Age, and one of the legends of PC game development, had to start somewhere. Schaefer joined LucasArts in 1989. It can't be understated how much George Lucas' interest in interactive entertainment impacted the young and growing art form. Schaefer basically did grunt work for several Scum Engine games before getting his big break, helping Ron Gilbert to both program and write dialogue for a very niche and mostly unheard of game called The Secret of Monkey Island. I'm sure no one here has ever heard of it. I can't believe I actually said escape there in the original recording. I am such a dumbass. His work there and on its sequel, game development was a much faster process back then. Opened up opportunities for him to start leading projects, the first of which was Day of the Tentacle. Look, Hoagie, it's a hamster. Just what I need for dissection lab tomorrow. It is now 1993. Those three scruffy Diet Coke addicts have become underground sensations by literally opening the gates of hell and selling Doom through shareware distribution, effectively creating the first truly viral game. At this time, I was gaming on my Sega Mega Drive. I honestly can't remember if I had the CD add-on at that point or not, but I was balls deep into Sonic the Hedgehog 3, Super Street Fighter 2, and Mortal Kombat 2. While I had shows like Games Master and Bad Influence to keep me updated on what was going on in other areas of the gaming world, PC gaming couldn't have been further from my mind. With the success of Day of the Tentacle though, Schaefer got to pitch his own project ideas directly to the money people, and it was at this time that he first submitted an idea for a comedic adventure game themed around the Day of the Dead alongside another proposal for a biker-themed game. The latter seemed easier to market and would likely have wider appeal than the former, and so it got the green light. So in 1995, when I was just discovering anime, and reading 2000 AD every week, yes, I was hyped about this movie, and I still enjoy watching it for all its faults, but we'll talk about that when we talk about this. Tim Schafer and LucasArts released Full Throttle, and it sold over a million units, more than 10 times the projected amount. So, since Tim was the man who could make anything he touches turn to gold, why not give him his dream project? Why not let him tell his crazy Day of the Dead story? What could possibly go wrong? Well, quite a lot actually. No, this isn't the story of mismanagement and publisher short-sightedness, crunch and a rushed release that we're used to today, in fact, Grim Fandango is one of the most critically acclaimed games ever, and routinely holds a spot on lists of all-time greatest games, including my own. It is, however, considered something of a commercial failure, selling around half as many units as Full Throttle, 
and there's no doubt that that game was cheaper to make than this one. No, this is a story of bad timing. The world was changing, market trends were shifting, 1998 was one of the most incredible years in gaming history, if not the most. And that's saying a hell of a lot given just how fast technology was progressing and how much developers were experimenting at that time. So in a year that had Ocarina of Time, Half-Life, Resident Evil 2, Metal Gear Solid, The Dreamcast and Sonic Adventure, Thief and countless more, was there really space for a quirky narrative adventure game with a unique art style and ambitious branching puzzles that left a lot of people stumped very early on? Graphical adventure games were fading out. They just weren't that popular anymore. They were slow and taxing on the brain in a world that was fast paced and high octane. The genre still had a couple of big last breaths in it before it would disappear, long enough for us all to realise how much we missed it and wanted it back, but it was definitely fading out. Still, if Grim Fandango was going to be a send off for the genre, then it's a good job that Schaefer brought his A plus game. Developing Grim Fandango presented many new challenges. Previous games had been developed in the Scum engine that Schaefer was more than familiar with, but this wasn't a 2D sprite based adventure. Grim Fandango is a full 3D game, rocking pre rendered backgrounds as seen in Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil, and the game Schaefer cites himself. Bioforge. Looks sick. And I think that kind of brings us to the stories and themes of the game, which is without question what makes it so beloved and so memorable. So let's talk about those. I'm not going to go over every element of the story here, but as this is quite an old game, I'm not going to be too shy about spoilers either. So just be aware of that moving forward. Tim Schafer drew on his interest in folklore and Aztec religion when crafting this story. In their beliefs, it was how a person died that affected where their soul wound up in the afterlife, not how they lived. But unless you had a somewhat dramatic death, not that uncommon given this was a culture that performed human sacrifices in their thousands. Your soul wound up in the underworld and had to embark on a four year laborious journey to reach its final resting place in the ninth underworld. So the four year journey of the soul became the central pillar around which the narrative was constructed and the major conflicts were weaved. In Schaefer's narrative, the journey begins in the Department of Death, which is where souls are brought after their passing. Here they are assessed for their eligibility for a number of travel packages that will make their terrifying and exhausting journey more luxurious and safer. Yep, no sooner has a soul escaped from a world of work and tax and they're shipped into another one filled with all the same old crap, and as we'll soon discover, all the same old corruption. In the opening scene we see Celso, a recently departed soul sitting and waiting nervously in an office, and as the door opens, a very ominous figure enters. The spectre of death himself, Manuel Calavera. The tone of this conversation shifts very quickly into the absurd though, when Manny goes from acting all dark and mysterious, to talking like a sleazy secondhand car salesman. Unfortunately for Celso, whatever passes for credit in the 8th Underworld, he isn't exactly flush with it. Still, never one to pass up a chance at a sale, Manny comes up with something to help this less than pristine soul take this most perilous of journeys. Yaha! Yes, that's the ticket! The Excelsior Line! Yes, she's a beauty! That compass and the handle will sure come in handy too. Oh, you're going to have a great trip. Wish I was going. Poor guy, I hope he makes it. Returning to his office we see the illusion of the tall dark reaper is even more of a sham than we thought. It would seem this gig is nothing more than a 9 to 5 chauffeur job with a fancy uniform and all the problems associated with working in sales. Grim Fandango's intro from the moment the LucasArts logo disappears to the moment we first take control of our hero is about 3 minutes long, and yet in those 3 minutes we are exposed to the game's art style, learn the basic lore of the world meet our hero and get a very brief idea of who he is and what his troubles currently are before being told exactly what our goal is for the opening chapter. It does this without any kind of opening crawl or making me feel like I'm just listening to some kind of excessive lore dump full of nonsense terms or made up names that I'll immediately forget. At no point during this cinematic do I feel the need to skip through it to get to the game. Three minutes and I know who I am, 
where I am, why I'm here, or as much as I need to, and what I need to do next. This is surgical storytelling right here. Not an ounce of fat on the meat. And on top of all of that, it's already comical and charming, and I am so happy to be here. While the story starts with Manny as a one-time hotshot salesman who's seemingly down on his luck, things take a turn down a darker path not long after. While Manny has been adamant for a while that his office nemesis Domino is literally handed all the good clients by his boss, leaving him and presumably everyone else in the DoD to pick up the scraps, he's being gaslit into thinking that he's just jealous of another salesman's success. He soon discovers, however, that not only is he right about Domino, but that this corruption goes far deeper and that a sinister force has inserted itself into the DoD and is actively robbing pure and charitable souls of their happy ever afters, leaving them to either take an arduous journey across the land of the dead on foot, facing all its trials and tribulations along the way, or, as we discover in Act 3, something much, much worse. The story is styled like some classic film noir epic. The elements of corruption come from an old Mexican burial tradition where a bag of gold is placed on the chest of the departed for them to take into the afterlife, and another is hidden in their coffin, in case that first bag is stolen. It makes me think somewhat of how the Greeks buried their dead with a coin to pay Charon, the ferryman, to be taken across the river Styx. Still, this idea that theft happened in the land of the dead is also what inspired Schaefer to write a crime epic set there. Of course, a great film noir piece needs a heroine, and that comes in the form of Mercedes Meche Colomar. Manny liberates Meche from Domino's client list, however he's unable to find an appropriate travel package for her, despite the fact she's a saint. Not even a teensy bit of killing? Maybe I just wasn't trying hard enough. So when she leaves to begin her journey on foot, while Manny is being chewed out by his boss, he feels responsible for her. In chasing after her, he begins his own four-year journey of labors that sees him rise from mopping the floors in a cafe to turning it into his own bar and casino, complete with rigged roulette tables. And from serving food on a ship to becoming its captain. Say what you want about our boy, he's got a nose for opportunity. Still, it seems his enemies have never lost sight of him, and that leads to more danger and excitement as our hero crosses to the very edge of the world and all the way back to his original office at the DoD to save the lost souls cheated by the corrupt system and the arch fiend sitting on top of it all. Manny is not alone in his labors, far from it in fact. Early on in the game he makes a lifelong friend in the form of Glottis, who is… actually, I'll let him explain. I am an elemental spirit summoned up from the land of the dead itself and given one purpose, one skill, one desire to drive or to change oil and adjust timing belts if no driving jobs are open. He's easily one of the best characters in the whole game and there's something very genuine about their friendship. I suppose Manny feels a sense of responsibility for Glottis since his shenanigans were what got the demon fired from the DoD in the first place. But they complement each other very well, and I love how well they bounce jokes and dialogue off each other. The story of Manny and Glottis is that of one door closing and another opening. Glottis starts out more or less trapped in a comically tiny shed for a creature with such a big frame. He's told he's too big to drive any of the cars, so he's basically just odd jobbing around the garage. On one hand, his involvement with Manny gets him fired, but on the other, it leaves him with the most badass car the DoD has ever seen, and once the two are reunited in the petrified forest, they begin a new adventure together that leads to truly wondrous places. It's a classic tale of escaping a seemingly safe environment that is in actual fact slowly killing you inside, and embracing a greater and more exciting life, making all kinds of wonderful friends, and having great adventures along the way. You know, I might quit my job today. Manny is likewise helped out by the Lost Souls Alliance. While this budding army of resistance has an impressive soldier count of two when they first meet, over the four years of the game's story, they develop into a powerful and dedicated force that is intent on bringing down their enemies by any means necessary. What? What makes you think I have a gun? You work for the most heavily armed organization in the land of the dead. Don't try to tell me they didn't issue you a gun. 
I don't work for the most heavily armed organization anywhere. You know, you're right. There are those rumors of that revolutionary army that's been stockpiling weapons. Actually them, I work for. The key figure of this group is Salvatore Limones. A one-time Reaper in the DoD himself, Salvatore is the very definition of a freedom fighter. He is tall, charismatic, fearless, and utterly dedicated to his cause. This is not simply found in his words and his actions, but in the fierce loyalty he inspires in those who fight alongside him. Thank you, sir! You have saved me! But more than that, you have enabled me to continue to serve the movement! But what is this corruption that these fierce and dedicated soldiers fight? What terrible power could be undermining the very department of death, meddling with the divine plan that would see honest people justly rewarded for their selfless lives? Could it be demons? Perhaps the very Prince of Darkness himself? No, it's a fat, opportunistic, sleazy gangster with absolutely no morals, who, through a combination of intimidation and what we can think of as murder in this world, has fabricated an elaborate scheme to steal tickets on the number 9 and sell on counterfeits to undeserving souls who get truly screwed in with the deal. Our enemy is Hector Lamans and he is an absolutely disgusting creature indeed. As with a lot of endgame villains though, Hector only gets limited screen time, being more of a name whispered in fear and awe by other characters in the game. Still, when Hector does put in an appearance, he certainly dominates the scene and wastes absolutely no time indulging his perversion. It's especially haunting at the very end of the game when we arrive at Hector's... garden. If we consider that all these plants are people Hector has sprouted and confined to whatever oblivion that implies, and the fact that he is quite content lounging around here and encouraging his plants to grow in his greenhouse, I mean, could you imagine if this was some kind of serial murderer who kept all his victims in a mass grave that he was just coming to play around in? Really disgusting. Even so, I don't think Hector is the villain I despise the most in this game. A great villain is one who can get under your skin. And this is often better achieved with smaller, more relatable slights than large, grandiose gestures. So in that regard, I'd say the biggest prick in the game award belongs to none other than Domino Hurley. While Hector revels in his perversion, almost like he hopes to fall so deep into hell that he comes out the other side, Domino has something far more human about him. He's smug. He's so self-satisfied. He gaslights Manny acting like the injustice he's experiencing is all in his head, and that he's the one who needs to get things straight. That smugness comes very much into play in Act 3 on the island at the edge of the world. By the way, Flat Earthers, this is how you prove the world is actually flat. You want us to show you the curve? How about you show us the edge? Here, Domino is running a forced labor camp staffed by all the souls whom Hector has robbed of their happy ever afters. While there's a giant squid and various old school methods of keeping the masses in line, Domino has a different idea for Manny. He just expects him to do as he's told. Yep, he's so smug and confident about the power he wields that he just assumes that Manny will toe the line and take his place managing the whole operation. What has he got over Manny? Why, the lovely Mercedes, of course. If Manny doesn't play along, she's the one who's going to feel the brunt of his displeasure. And if he does, He'll be stranded on a faraway island with her and not a lot else to do. Who knows what could happen? We get a sense of the way he manipulates the people around him from the Angelito kids here. It's established early on that they can raise hell for Domino if they want, but they're in that cage now, and they aren't about to leave for fear of what could happen to Mercedes. Where Hector is clearly a psychopath, Domino is a narcissist. He's somewhere between a school bully and an abusive spouse. He not only hurts you, but he makes it seem like it's your fault that it's happening and that he's actually doing you a favor by bringing you back into line. It doesn't help that he's so physically imposing either. These kinds of bullies rarely have much substance to them when faced with a more physically imposing opponent. Still, he gets what's coming to him in the end, and it never stops being satisfying. <laughs> Schaefer drew on numerous sources for his story, 
And just like any creative genius, he was able to smash together ideas that, on paper, looked like they had absolutely no business being together, but were executed in such a way that once you'd seen it, their pairing couldn't have been more obvious. While trawling the internet for information on this game's development, outside just citing and paraphrasing the Wikipedia entry, I found this interesting post on Quora that about sums up what I'm talking about. I was a project leader at LucasArts for many years and vividly remember the day Tim Schafer walked into our monthly pitch meeting and announced that he wanted to create a game called Grim Fandango. A game that, in his words, would be Mexican Day of the Dead meets Glengarry Glen Ross, a somewhat depressing yet brilliant 1990s film about a group of desperate real estate agents who will do just about anything to sell undesirable real estate to prospective buyers. If it had been anyone other than Tim Schafer, he would have been left out of the room. And while the group did its share of marveling at Tim's chosen folklore, we ultimately had the sense that Tim would apply his trademark humor, character development, and his ability to inspire great work from his team towards turning a genuinely offbeat premise into a work of art. And that he did. Yeah, fucking wild. So our visual style and much of the story is heavily influenced by the Day of the Dead festival held in early November in Mexico. I absolutely have to get to Mexico at least once in my lifetime to experience this, because it looks absolutely unreal. Also, you know, tequila. While this may look like some kind of crazy spooky zombie festival on the surface, and historically it shares origins with the old Aztec beliefs that inspire much of this game, this is actually a very Christian celebration to remember and honor departed loved ones in a very Roman Catholic part of the world. Since the people celebrating believe that their loved ones are returning to visit them, they put on Calavera face paint and throw a massive party so that they feel as welcomed as possible. In the story of the game too, the inhabitants of the Eighth Underworld are actually able to pass through to the land of the living and be close to their family once again during the festival. It holds a very similar meaning to the Buddhist Obon festival held in mid-August. The cast is made up of the deceased, who take the form of skeletons with builds presumably similar to those they had in life, and elemental spirits or demons manifested from the land that seem to exist to do the dirty work or just be a general nuisance in this land. The 3D skeletons are based on Kalaka figures that are bought and displayed during the festivals, while the demons and Manny's bone wagon are heavily inspired by Ed Big Daddy Roth's designs and drawings. The one-of-a-kind art direction and character design is further enhanced with voice performances by Cuban legend Tony Polana as Manny. Tempting as it is, I just can't bring myself to jump in the giant unclean kitty litter. Alan Bloomsfield as Glottis. I had no idea you liked gambling so much, Glottis. Well, the doctors made me promise I wouldn't do it anymore. But they can't get in the high rollers loud, Doc, can they? and Maria Canales Barrera as Mercedes. Work with me, Meche. Give me some dirt. Well, I could do something bad right now if that would help. The music was composed by Peter McConnell and is considered something of a masterpiece in its own right. I could pad out this video with information about these wonderful people, their histories and achievements, but honestly, I think their skills are best displayed in this video, taken from E3 2018. It popped into my feed since I've been doing my homework on the game, and while here they all are, reprising their roles in a stage reading of some of the game's most iconic scenes, alongside brutal legends and Super Mario movie star Jack Black, and Tim Schafer himself as the narrator. The ease in which they slip into the roles they haven't played for decades and totally embody those characters, especially Alan Bloomsfield. I can literally see Glottis' face in the way he emotes. Speaks volumes about their skill and passion for their craft. I had no idea this had happened prior to stumbling onto it, but if you haven't seen it, you have to check it out. It's as funny as you'd expect. And I have to wonder if E3 had focused more on gamer-centered moments like this, and not all the cringe that Scott talks about in his video here, would it have survived the pandemic and still be going strong today? Looking at the 3D character models, you can probably tell that they are very low poly, with Manny being around 250 polygons. Meanwhile, someone like the Doom Slayer today is in the region of 250,000 polys, with much higher texture resolution. 
This is another reason the stylized look for the game works so well though. Trying to create anything resembling realism under such strict conditions really isn't going to work. And whatever success you do have at the time, it's going to look dated in a matter of years. Especially with how far forward technology moved with each generation back then. These blocky, larger than life characters with faces that were little more than animated textures were so striking and expressive that they not only worked back then, but they've also withstood the test of time. Of course, we can see some of the visual improvements made to the HD version by changing a few settings in the options, but the amazing art direction played a big part in making this old game clean up so well. Since rendering vast 3D worlds would have been a performance nightmare for home PCs back in 1998, the pre-rendered backgrounds of games like Alone in the Dark, Resident Evil, and the majority of games occupying my all-time top 10 list were implemented to help keep their detail level high while having minimal impact on the performance. Previous Scum Engine games used hand-drawn pixel art for the characters and backgrounds, meaning changing a camera angle in a scene would mean needing to redraw the whole thing from a new perspective. However, since the backgrounds in Grim Fandango were full 3D environments built on LucasArts powerful top NPCs, they could be rendered from multiple angles to create the dramatic camera switching effect we all love in these games. These backgrounds were complemented by full motion videos that would run any time a dramatic change in camera angle was needed. I always get a pang of excitement when I see stuff like this happen. The transition isn't, and never was, seamless. But it did its job well enough in those old Final Fantasy games and many others like them. As you can see here, the theme is 1930s Art Deco. Much like that found in Andrew Ryan's, um, Utopia? Of Rapture in Bioshock. Here it's been smashed together with Aztec art designs and yeah, these two things really do work together. During our four year excursion, we are treated to a variety of locations, the biggest and most challenging of these being Rubicava. Believe it or not, I'd actually completely forgotten about the island at the edge of the world in chapter three, but oh boy do I remember this place. And the underwater section. I mean, who could forget a piece of music history like this? The area has a variety of locations, starting at the Calavera Cafe with its basement casino, where Manny does his real <coughs> legitimate business, to the VIP lounge of a giant cat racetrack, where we can meet one of the other criminal elements of the Eighth Underworld. Don't worry. Maximino's a pussycat compared to Hector. Then there's the dark and smoky hipster bar running a kind of open mic night, and even a solitary lighthouse signaling out to the endless ocean that forms the location for one of the game's biggest tragedies. Oh, Lola. Each location perfectly captures the vibe and feel of this seedy, dark town we found ourselves stuck in. Sure, it looks like a party on the surface, but bubbling just below the surface is something far more dangerous. Which I guess brings us to the story influences. While the game has a fantastical setting, and all the trademark charm and humour expected of LucasArts graphical adventure games, the story is very much inspired by film noir, and the literary works of writers such as Dashiell Hemet, the man who gave us the hard-boiled private detective Sam Spade. I've only actually read The Maltese Falcon from this genre, and I have to say it was a very good read that, as someone unfamiliar with the genre, ended in a very surprising way. The game borrows heavily from Casablanca, and Tim Schafer isn't at all shy about sharing his influences in this video here over on the official Double Fine YouTube channel. You should definitely check it out if you like this game. The primary villain, Hector Le Mans, for example, is inspired by Signor Ferrari. I can see the resemblance. Manny's casino look and even shots from this part of the game have been lifted directly from the movie too. All this combines into a wonderful stylish world of danger and intrigue and along with all the comedy and the great soundtrack scoring the whole thing, it just piles the charm higher and higher and makes you want to keep coming back here again and again. While Grim Fandango does all the things that the other LucasArts graphical adventure games do, being 3D added a few challenges. Also, I want to take this opportunity to talk about how to actually do a puzzle game like this really well. I've seen Grim Fandango being accused of having moon logic puzzles, the likes of which are famous for putting the genre into a coma. However, 
I strongly disagree with this point for a lot of reasons. For a start, LucasArts and Tim Schafer had a lot of experience in doing this well, and were actually very good at it. It might seem like a reach to expect people to figure out how to get some pigeon eggs with only a baguette and a balloon animal of Robert Frost. Run, you pigeons! It's Robert Frost! But take a look at this. Bang! Ah. Admittedly, this moment can happen a couple of scenes too early to seem significant, but this is how these games used to do hints without specifically telling you that they were. As a companion to this little talk of mine, I really recommend Yahtzee's talk about Monkey Island puzzles here on The Escapist. I know there's been a lot of drama between that website and its creators, and I do find Yahtzee's trademark snark more than a little grating at times, but that doesn't change the fact that the man knows what he's talking about. One criticism that Schaefer received for Full Throttle was that it was too short. As such, he wanted this game to be twice as long, with double the puzzles. This, along with the narrative of the four-year journey of the soul, led to him dividing the game into four distinct sections and creating non-linear puzzle paths to complete each section. This is another of the game's great features. Let's take Rubicava as an example here. Manny's main objective is to board the SS Limbo in order to chase after Mercedes and Domino. To that end, he needs to complete a laundry list of objectives, including making sure there's space for him on the crew, getting a Maritime Union card, and getting Union-approved shipworking tools for Glottis. On this replay, I actually had a small issue with this section. All the point-and-click adventures have an issue known as pixel hunting. It was one of the things people did when they were stumped on how to continue. They moved the mouse around the screen slowly and tried to find some tiny collision box that they'd overlooked on their previous outing. This being a 3D game designed to be played with a controller, a more intuitive system was implemented. Basically, Manny looks at things that he can interact with as he gets closer to them. This is a great way to keep things like UI elements and on-screen text down to an unobtrusive minimum, and they used a similar design philosophy for the inventory too. Rather than have some on-screen real estate dedicated to the UI, Manny just goes rooting through his inside jacket pocket in search of what he has stashed there. The only thing I didn't like about this is that you can only inspect one item at a time, and have to root through them all to find the one you want. For some reason, especially when my pockets were fairly full, the item I wanted always seemed to be the one farthest away from the first one I pulled out. On a case-by-case -case basis, we're probably only talking seconds here, but stretched out over the course of the entire game, it's something that can get a little under your skin. So, where was I? Oh yeah, the head movement. So the Harbour Master Velasco here is the one who gives you the list of objectives that sets you up for Chapter 2. At the moment, he's working on a ship in a bottle. This is an item you can pick up and use much later in the game. However, the interaction zones for these two things are very close. So when I thought I was talking to Velasco, I was actually looking at the bottle, leading me to believe that he didn't have anything important to share with me before I ran back to the cafe to talk to Glottis. This of course locked me out of the conversation with Chow Chilla Charlie about the Union card, and led to me running in circles for quite a while before I finally consulted a guide and realized my mistake. I'm prepared to say that this one was on me overall, but there's still a case for this being some sort of gameplay bug, or at the very least, poorly thought out design. So back to non-linear puzzle design. By having multiple objectives to work on, you aren't forced to just beat your head against a single challenge over and over like it's some kind of Dark Souls boss fight. You can usually find a way to progress at least one arc of the story if you get stuck on another. And since the items you need to bypass the various obstructions you're faced with are scattered all over an area, you'll probably stumble onto the keys that unlock the doors for Puzzle B while you're looking for the ones that deal with Puzzle A. As complex as it seems, you just need to be observant. As an example, let's look at a couple more Rubicava puzzles. The mess hall manager of the SS Limbo, Naranya, still isn't on board the ship, and if he doesn't make the departure, then Manny can have his spot. It turns out that he's getting a new tattoo ground into his bones. Looking around the tattoo parlor, we discover that the artist is out of the liquid nitrogen that he normally uses to numb the pain in his customers. So Naranya is knocking back some pretty strong liquor to keep him in the chair. Oh, and notice that Manny looks at the bottle. Aha, uh -huh. I wonder what we can do here. Then later, in the Blue Casket Club, we see the way to adding the secret ingredient to the coughing shots, and then the effect they have on the unfortunate soul who ordered one. So we may start to put two and two together here, but we're still missing something, and since whatever it is doesn't seem to be available right now, 
why don't we focus on that union card? This thread sees us going to the VIP lounge of the cat races to liberate some of Chowchilla Charlie's goods from Maximino. And it's only by following this route and getting into the kitchen of the VIP lounge that we find... Jackpots. As odd as these solutions might be, they're presented in a way that makes total narrative sense and nudges you in the right direction in a more immersive and natural way than, say, a hint button. Another example of this kind of integrated help is the character of Crispin in the 2014 point-and-click adventure game, Primordia. This game is a little too short to warrant its own extensive analysis, but I strongly recommend it. Crispin is a little flying helper bot that was built by the protagonist Horatio. As well as being a fun character who our hero can bounce dialogue off, and an important tool for solving various puzzles involving things out of reach or in small areas, Crispin may have something to say on his creator's current predicament if you talk to him, something that might get you thinking along the right lines about what to do next. I love Crispin. So, aside from a couple of technical issues, I'd say these puzzles are very fair. In the event that you find yourself stuck up against something very abstract like how to disarm this bomb, for example, just use the mantra, when you can only do a little, do the little you can things will start to open up from there. So, there aren't really any unfair puzzles. Well, okay, this one underwater where you have to grab Geppetto and then move him closer to Glottis so that our big demon friend can pick him up, that one's annoying. But only because if you mess up, you've got to wait for him to trudge all the way back around to you before you get another try. And I'm a big believer that games should never be wasting people's time. Oh, and this one here, where you're following a trail of Sproutella by grinding up bone onto it. What was the point of this line? Bowsley's probably in that maze, but I'd never be able to find him without, well, without something really helpful. The game just wants me to keep doing what I was already doing, but when he said that, I ran off thinking I'd missed something. But the rest are fine. So the last thing to bring up here are the dialogue trees. I've been very vocal in the past about my dislike for these. The way I see it, you're going to click through every topic so as not to miss anything, so there's no point to them being divided up like this. It's a kind of fake gameplay, a cutscene where you press a button to continue, similar to a QTE. Still, that doesn't mean that they can't be done well, and I've softened up on the concept as a whole since playing Disco Elysium. While that game is one of a kind, it's basically a massive dialogue tree, where the paths you choose actually matter, and choosing certain options locks you out of others, meaning you actually have to think about the things you say to people. Very much like in real life, actually. Grim Fandango isn't anywhere near as sophisticated as this. In fact, it goes the opposite way, by keeping the dialogue short and snappy, and the dialogue tree options to just the essentials, and maybe a little small talk and gags. This is the other good way to do it. You don't need numerous submenus that players have to work through to find the one line they need to progress the damn quest. There are a few characters that will only cough up the goods on the second time you talk to them. This is a little annoying, as you may just assume they have nothing of value to say, and run off leaving them alone. But I suppose it's worth considering that this isn't a game that has redundant NPCs. I mean, we've already talked about the engine limitations here, so it's safe to assume that if there's a character in the scene who you can talk to, they're going to play a part in one of our puzzles. I love stories. Stories are my main reason for playing games, and games are my favourite way to enjoy stories. Stories and their heroes come in all shapes and sizes. They teach us, inspire us, and they make us imagine or even believe that our stories can be better, that it can all work out in the end. The interactive medium is, in my opinion, the best place to explore things like deep psychological trauma or the dangers of resisting change to embrace a status quo. Those stories challenge us, make us ask bigger questions of ourselves and the world around us. We can experience vulnerability and abuse from the comfort of our sofas and gaming chairs, and maybe become a little more understanding and empathetic of those who've undergone something similar in their lives. We can see the corruption of powerful institutions, and look at how they manipulate the narrative of the world to create a dependency on them, all the better to subjugate us and make us too fearful to challenge their authority, 
and then maybe, we can ask if this is something our institutions are doing to us. Do these people really have our best interests at heart? Or do they just want us to remain docile sheep so they can have a free ride on our collective backs forever? The monsters we face can be manifested representations of trauma or injustice. And as we swing our magic swords to slay these beasts, we ask ourselves if maybe we should be doing the same in our lives too. There's power in all these themes, ideas, and, dare I say it, politics. It's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to make us challenge our own views and explore a wider world of ideas, and that's no less true for the classic underdog hero's journey. This is what Manny's story is. A down-on-his-luck salesman stuck in an endless cycle of disappointment, he has a call to something greater and begins his own exciting adventure to set right a terrible wrong. This story may not be open-ended or one that challenges established norms, but it's about an unlikely hero and his even more unlikely best friend taking a journey together and trying to set the world to rights for no other reason than that's how it should be. It could of course be argued that Manny's motivations are a little simpler than that. There's certainly more than a hint of electricity in the room between him and Mercedes when they first meet. But regardless of how it all starts, we wind up on this whirlwind adventure with larger-than-life villains, the freedom fighter who would sacrifice it all for his cause, the dangerous femme fatale, a trip all the way to the end of the world taken by two best friends, and a great struggle to balance the scales to see the innocent saved and the guilty brought to their righteous end. Along the way we laugh, we cry, we become frustrated with our trials, and we cheer as the bad guys get exactly what's coming to them. Manny and Glottis are not your average heroes. They show us that we don't have to be tall, strong and fearless like Salvatore to stand up for what's right. Even the odd people and the misfits can make a stand and live a life that's greater than they ever imagined possible. We never find out why Manny Calavera was conscripted into the DoD. Certainly, he doesn't seem to be one of the good souls deprived of their ticket on the number 9 by Hector. But neither is he so selfish as to not at least warrant a chance to just walk the whole way to the ninth underworld. Still, in the end, all wrongs are righted and all sins forgiven. Whatever his origins, Manny Calavera becomes the hero of the eighth underworld. And while there's one last tearful goodbye to be had, he can finally move on to whatever comes next. This is why I love Grim Fandango. This is why I came back to it so many times in the past, and I still absolutely love playing it, even now. This is why it's so highly acclaimed and so well loved by countless people all over the world. Even with the visuals and puzzle design showing their age, somewhat, the passion of the artists, voice actors, musicians and writers, every single person who worked on this game shines through in every element of it. This is another game with a soul. A beautiful and unrivaled, one of a kind that serves as a gold standard to be aspired towards. It's a wonderful tale of a battle between good and evil, where the books get balanced at the end, and our hero gets to ride off into the sunset with the love of his own life. And while this is a wonderful end to a wonderful story, I think nothing sums up my feelings better than Manny's own final line. Is this? Nobody knows what's going to happen at the end of the line. You might as well enjoy the trip. So, with that unexpected detour down nostalgia lane cleaned up, it's back to Thief, I think. Well, not quite. The spooky season is about to roll in, and I'd love to start making a regular Halloween special. I know I mentioned in a previous community post that I was interested in doing the Evil Within 1 and 2 in a single longer video, similar to my Ethan Winters video, that has become massively popular by my standards, completely out of the blue. I am, unfortunately, easily distracted. And since Tango Games got a second chance at life, I don't exactly need to eulogize them just yet. And then there's this other game that caught my eye, in no small part thanks to my friend Jared covering it over on his channel Avalanche Gaming. That being the original PS2 Fatal Frame, or Project Zero as we call it in the UK. 
While it was a trip back into classic survival horror that initially hooked me, I became intrigued by the claim that the game was based on a true story. Specifically because if there was some real event that took place somewhere in Japan that inspired all this, well, I can go there. Unfortunately, it became very apparent very early on that this tagline was being applied in a way that seriously stretches the idea of creative license. However, in researching it, I fell into something of a Japanese folklore rabbit hole, and I think we can all enjoy a few campfire ghost stories for Halloween. So with that in mind, while you can definitely expect a thief video sometime soon, keep your eyes peeled for my own exploration of Project Zero. Well, well, well. Look who's still here. Either you stepped away from your computer too long to stop this video at the end, or you've just gotten used to me doing these little sign-offs along with a tease of the next video. I hope you've enjoyed our brief tour down memory lane with this one. I honestly can't believe it's been so long since I replayed this game. And worse still, just how long the remaster has been sitting in my Steam library without me ever properly taking it on again. I'd like to thank The Summer of Mark once again for contributing to this video, this time with his narration skills, and I'll link his channel and Twitter down below if you'd like to know more about what he's about. I highly recommend his videos though. Anyway, that's about it from me until next time. I think I've got a loose wire in my helmet rubbing against my skull that I need to get checked out at the Bone Zone. So I'll sign off for now and hope to see you all next time.